Well, in Texas, we start every speech off with a big howdy. 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 And so I'm going to say howdy, howdy, and you get to respond. So howdy. 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 Well, that's pretty good. But in Texas, we do it a lot better than that now. This is the Filipinos. <laughs> you know the fatality of things that other people don't. So let's try it one more time. Besides, you don't want to fall asleep, right? <laughs> howdy. Oh, oh, that's much better, that's much better. So that makes me much more relaxed. <laughs> All right, speaking of Filipino hospitality, it is in a class of its own, by the way. I have traveled the world. I've been to places that were rude to me. I've been to places who almost put me in jail. I've been to places where the food is horrible. When I come here, your reputation for hospitality, you have to experience yourself. You can't because it's you. However, I can tell you how wonderful it is. Every single person I meet smiles at me and says hello, and most of them offer me some food. <laughs> and the food is really good. Most of the time when I travel the world, I come across food that I cannot eat, and I generally miss something from home. When I'm in Romania, they have white cheese, I miss yellow cheese. When I'm in Europe, they have bad food, and I miss good food. <laughs> but when I'm in the Philippines, I don't miss anything, the food is delicious. And as I said, everybody tries to feed you some. As a matter of fact, I, I hear that I'm going to try something in a little while called Baloo, and I am excited about this, I think. Raise yourself. Raise yourself. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. The University of Philippines has just has done an outstanding job putting this conference together. I've speaking at many, many conferences, many, many different places, what an incredible, incredible job the university has done. Dr. Sanchez, Dr. Demopoulos is just amazing. Your crew uh, that has put everything together. Uh, having traveled in internationally, it was a very long trip. It took me about 36 hours from my house to get to this hotel. I was very tired. Uh, but there was a group of people that took care of me that was just incredible. And they have done that all the way to this point. I'd like to recognize uh, Freudian, Gino, Lisa, and Richard, you guys have just been wonderful taking care of me. And the rest of the staff, an incredible job putting together an incredible conference. One of the things I really enjoy today is that I know that my presentation is in line. After listening to Dr. Tadeo, you're going to hear a lot of my stuff is going to parallel his. There is one major difference with me between I and Dr. Tadeo. He has really good hair and I have none. <laughs> Is global warming real? Now there's a lot of people in here that think, oh absolutely sir, that's a dumb question. But there's some people out there who don't believe that. But if you look at this picture, what you'll see here is you only have to look at the sky, look at the land, and look at our water. When I say our, I'm talking about beautiful, sunny California, USA, the Sunshine State. And this is the Philippines. So regardless of what you think, there's a problem. Global warming is a major issue. We'll have other issues here that are right at our fingertips that we can solve. We made this mess and we can solve this problem. Everybody knows what it takes every day in our lives to get along. It takes wrappers, it takes water bottles, it takes tires. There's all kinds of waste that we create out there that we have to deal with. So there is a problem, and it's huge. It's very, very large. There are a lot of municipal solid waste problems. The volumes are huge. As we've heard earlier today, it's up to 40,000 tons per day right here in the Philippines. Well, there's this bad thing about dump sites and landfills and things, is they create poisons. There's toxins that leach into our water, into our, into our soils. And there are methane and other gases, sometimes just pure stinkiness that comes out into the air. These are not good things. These are not good things at all. There's another problem out there. And that problem has to do with our electricity supply. Electricity rates are among the highest in the world here. I live in Texas where they're probably some of the lowest in the world, yet we have very, very similar problems. There are times when our grid supply runs short. It may be inexpensive, 
But things can happen to where your reliability may fall. And low reliability and high prices are actually an issue that happens all around the world regardless of where you go. Domestic renewable energy production is different in every place that I travel to. What's very interesting, what's very wonderful is how hard that y'all are working just from what I've seen today, I'm getting the equation right. You have a very challenging geography. I spent 29 years before I retired in July of last year working for a utility company. I started out in the very beginning as a lineman going in a college program. I worked on the lines, the very large ones and the small ones. I worked on the substations. Eventually I moved up into management after getting a couple degrees under my belt. Decided I didn't want to work that hard anymore. Climbing poles are hard on the knees, by the way. But uh, I've worked all the way through the industry and realized that how hard it is. One of the things that I worked on at one time, though, was actually grid forecasting, figuring out what load was going to be required in five years and how would we possibly meet that load for the new generation. And this was before renewable energy. I remember that our company put in a wind turbine, one, and we were really excited about it because we were the green company. We had one turbine, and the most of the time it did not work. <laughs> However, today when you come to Texas, you'll see the largest wind generation state in the United States. Many, many, many megawatts. When you fly over some of the locations, you will see wind turbines from an airplane from one side of your view to the other. Amazing amount of uh, electricity there. But the Philippines is a little bit different than sometimes in Texas and other places. You have a very challenging geography. You have a lot of trees. You have a lot of different islands and things. It's very hard to make sure you have a stable electricity supply. And remember, electricity supply needs to be in a balanced energy portfolio. It takes a little bit of everything to keep it working just right. We want to move forward and make it a lot better. Well, there's one thing about problems that you have is problems create opportunities. You have a large amount of biomass and municipal solid waste, and you have a lot of high energy prices. That's kind of the problem. But along with that, the opportunity starts to efface. You have the opportunity to use waste and energy and other solutions to solve these problems. So far I've talked about the municipal solid waste side, which is incredible feedstock potential, a lot of BTUs there, but also, I'd like to mention shortly that you have an incredible agricultural biomass potential. We've heard about that some from others, but you have millions and millions of tons of biomass, which equals hundreds and thousands of megawatts of power potential. When you start balancing your portfolio with waste and energy, not only do we start solving some of those toxic issues around the dumps, some of those other issues around having a massive amounts of unused agricultural waste, but you'll start reducing your power process and increasing your stability just by using waste of energy. It's part of that balanced portfolio that your country seeks. Rice, coconut, and sugar cane, just among the few here in, the, in um, almost said the United States. That's how comfortable I am. Right here in the Philippines, it's just a little bit of the stuff that you have. You talked about having material recovery facilities going in. These are incredible resources. Material recovery facilities take the trash and they separate it. They take out the things that can be reused and the residual will go to where? It goes to the landfill in most cases. But guess what? That residual waste is the number one feedstock for many of the waste and energy solutions. So your recyclable curve is actually now going up higher. There is another concept that we've been working on for some time and I haven't heard of it today, so I'll introduce it. It's called landfill mining, or dump mining. There's a solution that you can use to actually go back to the dumps that you have and actually mine that leftover residual stuff, things that are causing the problem. You can do this with automation. You can also do it with manual labor. It's a great economic development tool, but go back to your landfills and mine out those plastics and other contents that you can use for incredible waste and energy opportunities. And obviously, energy is the driving force behind most economic development. And along with energy, you're going to have jobs. Jobs are incredibly good for an economy. Everybody likes to have them. I think everybody in here probably has one if you're not retired. I partially work now after I retire, but I really enjoy what I do. 
Waste Energy Company needs power plant operators, mechanics, chemical engineers, biomass producers. Feedstock management alone adds a lot of jobs. We've talked about some of those problems today. You have buyers and brokers and gatherers and choppers and shredders. You have solid fuel creation, pelletizing, equipment operators, and on and on. Other jobs are faced right alongside this industry um, that, that go with administration, government officials, etc. To realize these opportunities, you have to do the thermal chemical conversion of biomass to get there. There's three types of it. The first one is called combustion. We've talked about that some. Dr. Today will talk about combustion quite a bit. And it's a great viable opportunity using biomass. The thing about combustion is, in a lot of places, there's to some, some environmental and public distaste for it. However, just think about what's happening. A lot of your BTU content you're burning in the fields. You need to use the combustion that you have. How does the combustion work? It's very simple. You basically light something on fire and you have a plenty of oxygen, so it produces heat. One of the biggest combustions that you'll see is just literally a stove. In a lot of countries, they still use charcoal and, and uh, wood and straw for fuel to cook with. Oddly enough, believe me guys, that's waste to energy. I mean, you don't, you, don't, you don't categorize it like that. You don't just have to cook with electricity. There's also using the heat from um, combustion to, turn a boiler, to, to activate a boiler. Using the steam from the boiler to turn a steam turbine which then can turn a generator and create electricity. You can also use that steam for district heating. What we specialize at at SDL is gasification. Gasification is a unique process. However, it's not a new process. It's been out for over 180 years. If you go back to World War II, gasification was used in almost 9 million vehicles to power the vehicles. They were called wood gas burners. And they literally pulled a trailer around behind them, they gasified the wood, took the gas, ran it to the motors. Very, very old technology. However, it is now becoming economically viable to gasify waste and offset uh, not only the environmental issues, but create an active uh, economic development opportunity. How do gasifiers work? Basically, you have a very low oxygen environment, you have a heated chamber, in our technology, we use a fluidized bed. So we would take small rocks, sometimes dolomite and other, other bits and pieces, and we fluidize them by stirring them in the air with a fan. Then we add heat to that chamber and we create that with a fossil fuel. That heat is generally used with propane or gas. You can use fuel oil. Um, you heat that chamber to about 1,000 degrees, you inject your waste, and because it can't combust, the thermochemical conversion happens and it turns to gas, synthesis gas, producer gas, syngas, has multiple names, but it turns to a gas product. That gas is mostly can, um, has uh, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and hydrogen. It's a low BTU gas, but it actually does a great job in several ways. Some of those ways are, once again, you can use that gas to light a boiler. You can reform that gas slightly and run a gas turbine, or you can run it through a motor and create electricity that way. Once again, district heating, electricity can be created out of that. SDL, our company, has invested in a unit that actually can use a conversion process through catalyst that will take the thin gas and create liquid fuels. We hope to have that lined up and working in 2000, late 2016 and 17. We look forward to that. Another byproduct that's not on here that goes, uh, I guess, toward what uh, uh, Mr. Joshua was talking about earlier is our land, after being farmed for many, many years, the soil becomes dead. It needs help. And fertilizer will not activate that soil. He, 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 just, couched, he just couched it so well earlier today when he said, you have to take care of your soil. So one of the other byproducts of gasification, specifically to use agricultural waste is biochar. I'm a member of the International Biochar Initiative and basically there is an incredible opportunity to use biofoil, biochar for land amendment um, and um, for soil amendment. In other words, it reactivates your soil, pulls the carbon out of the air and, and basically helps uh, 
reactivate the soil. You need a lot less fertilizer, uh, about a third to half as much fertilizer to, uh, to work the land. So another product that comes out of that is biochar. However, if you utilize the, bio, uh, the gasifier with heavy plastics and things like that, the char is better used for landfill capping and our road paving, things like that. The last thing that we do at SDL is called pyrolysis. Pyrolysis works similar to gasification, except it's in a zero oxygen environment. Once again, you can do the same things that uh, creating syn gas, you can create bio oil, or you can create charcoal. Sometimes they call it charcoal coat. You can literally create charcoal to cook with, coat to make metals with. You can run motors, gas turbines, and boilers to create electricity and liquid fuels. It's kind of a crazy chart, but this is waste to energy in a nutshell. These three technologies are actually how you get there. It's very pleasant to see that you've got a good start along that path in some of those areas. Guess what? It's not that easy. There's some significant challenges out there that you have to face. One of them is just seeking the right technology. We've heard about this a lot today, which is the right one of the three for your application. Well, a lot of that will depend on what is the nature of your biomass? Is it municipal solid waste? Is it rice husk, etc.? Some of that will make a difference in what you use. At SDL, we have stationary units that we set in place. We try to place those near the biomass. We also have mobile units. The mobile unit, uh, we don't have a picture of, but our stationary unit at the top is a three and a half megawatt plant that uses uh, about 120 tons a day of municipal waste in a pelletized form. The uh, mobile unit uses about eight to 10 tons. We actually can move that to where the uh, biomass is stationed. This next unit you see at the bottom, we call the PyroMed 250 is a pyrolysis. This machine was designed strictly for medical waste. There's a big issue with getting rid of medical waste in the United States. We're no longer allowed to combust it very well. We don't have many. At one time, 11 years ago, there were over 3,000 combustion units in the United States. And today, there are less than 20. They're not very well desired. Medical waste is really stacking up. It's a real, real big problem. And it's getting scarier, isn't it? When you think about Ebola and other viruses and things, you really want those things that they use to really be destroyed. This paralysis unit runs at about 1150 C, so about 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. It kills everything. It takes metal and glass, we shove everything through it. Our gasifier runs at about 800 C, or 1400 degrees, and it does not uh, utilize metal and glass. Now, we selected the units. We realized we want a waste energy unit through conversion paralysis, combustion paralysis, or gasification. But then we got to make sure we have enough biomass for the life of a plant. Our plants are designed for 20 years. We talked a lot about how hard it is to get the biomass lined up. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a, in a moment. You also have to have proximity to power, gas, and water when you build a power plant. You have permits and plannings. Dr. Taneo went over very well how hard it is sometimes to get permits and things. You have to create markets. You have to create markets for electricity and heat. Well, there's waste destruction markets that can be created. Gas and liquid biofuels that can be created. Solid fuels and even markets for biochar. Biochar in uh, Hawaii right now is selling for about $13 a pound. And regretfully, they don't have a lot of ways to make it, so you almost have to import it. But it's so expensive because it works incredibly, incredibly well on their farms there. The next one is the biomass hurdles. It's very, very hard to get over this challenge. Biomass needs to be produced in a sustainable, renewable way. But there's some issues. One of them is just literally delivering it. I saw several pictures of where the trucks were just stacked up really high. And um, it's because biomass often doesn't weigh a lot. It's kind of light. And the energy density can be low in some of the lighter uh, biomass. So it's really hard to truck and move. Well, large quantities are required. These machines use 40, 60, 200 tons a day. That's a really large amount. One of those, if you fill this room right here full of biomass, you only have two days worth of feedstock. If you fill it completely full, it's still just two days worth. So it takes mountains of biomass to run these machines. Then, you have the quality 
and the moisture content issues around biomass. One of them is how do you pay someone for it? Just think about it. In the really dry part of the year, a truckload of straw would weigh X. Add some rain on top of that, and it pays 2X because it's heavier. So it's hard to pay by the pound. It's hard. So you realize you have to come up with a fair means of payment, and then you've got to make sure there's not contaminants, etc., uh, associated with that. <laughs> but the good thing is, guys, ladies and gentlemen, is success in the Philippines is imminent. <laughs> imminent. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. You guys have the secret sauce. You're right there. Everything's lined up. Not only did you do the right things, you're sitting here again, once again, pushing really hard to go over that tipping point. Mature waste energy technologies are out there. They're available today. The market rules and government rules, they're in place here in the Philippines. Biomass park market is already growing here. You have an abundant amount of biomass available. It's all lining up. You do have insufficient amount of electricity and high power prices in some cases. That actually helps the biomass market get its on its feet. You have the ability to get liquidity and capital to build these plants. People are lining up. The government is lining up. The university is lining up. You have a talented labor force. You have everything in order. There's nothing stopping this from happening in the Philippines. Nothing is stopping this unless you let bureaucracy and, 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 uh, and governmental roadblocks and things like that get in the way. You have to pull together as a team and push these things through. It's never going to be easy, but the timing is very, very right. One of the things I wanted to talk about before I finished was some of the lessons learned as we commercialized our unit. Our founder, Dr. Dar, worked really, really hard uh, coming up with this gasification solution that, that you've seen in these pictures. One thing that we worked on as a team, though, is uh, we basically had to not confuse need with demand. See, in the Philippines, you have the need, but you also have the demand. There are many countries that have the need, but they're not even close to having the demand. They have no material waste facility pickups. They have no trucks. Their biomass is very far away. A lot of the countries I'm working with in, in Africa, they really need these things. But the biomass hurdles, getting the feet stuck together and managed, is just almost impossible. Secondly, Dr. Dar, he vetted technologies throughout the world. We looked at very large plants. We looked at very small plants. We decided that the state of the world was going toward distributed generation and or microgrids. An interesting fact that the American biggest security issues in our homeland has to do with our grid. In America, the Department of Defense has stated our biggest vulnerability is that our grid is so tied together. So if a terrorist attack or somebody crazy Texan decides to take out the grid, you take out the whole state of Texas, you take out the whole Northeast, and guess what's in there? Our military defense uh, bases are inside those grids, and they're dependent on those grids. So the future of small-scale power production is very, very important. You can put these machines where the load is, you can put them where the biomass is, and you avoid some of these kind of problems. We've really worked hard to make sure that we're using the right technologies and use, uh, to, to make sure we get to where we want to be. We're willing to let our ideas change. Matter of fact, they changed a little too much for a while. The reason I was brought in was to operationalize the company. It's time to sell the unit. I have an iPhone 6 in my pocket. There were 10 iPhones before that. The iPhone 1 was what? It was a great phone, right? Everybody bought one. Millions of people bought one. You know why they sold the iPhone 1? Because it was time to stop tinkering and go to market. And so what SDL has decided to do is, we'll let our ideas change, but it's time to stop tinkering and go to market. And we know that 10 generations from now, in 10 or 15 years, we'll have a better product. That's the way of products. We test our products vigorously. We design with high quality 
parts. Some of our testing has been very interesting. One of the things we wanted to test was emergency stock. We had to test our plants at every capacity. So we had running the plant wide open, really force feeding it, getting it really, really, really wound up, making a whole lot of gas. And then my job was, without anybody knowing, is to hit the emergency stop button. And it was kind of fun. Everybody looked at me like I had lost my mind. And uh, one of the engineers that was helping us, he said, just sent me a text message. He said, shut down the plant. We have these red buttons all around the plant. Everybody knows what those are. So I hit the red button. A massive amount of gas was diverted from our generator into our flare. We had a 30 million BTU flare. Well, we used 40 million BTUs. So we had a kind of a melted looking flare. So we upgraded, now we have a 45 million BTU flare. And so that's how you test things. And we act in the long-term best interest of our customers. We continue to improve our technology, provide continual support. We require active participation of our customers. You can't commercialize a product without seeing what your customers will say. And lastly, we hire incredibly smart people. Dr. Dara said that started after I showed up. All right. As a wrap up, this is our uh, Gallus plant. This is a three and a half megawatt plant. This plant will actually take any carbon substance and create gas, syn gas. We've tested it on everything but tires and coconut shells, I believe. We didn't have enough coconut shells in Texas. But, but we know it'll work. And so we use an engineered fuel blend uh, that, that creates this, um, this gas. And we tweaked it and tweaked it. When it was originally designed, it was designed to be a one megawatt plant. Then as we tweaked it, our efficiencies went up. We can actually get up to five megawatts, depending on the feedstock and the BT content out of this plant. Well, that kind of concludes everything that I have to say today. And I'll, be, uh, I, I'll probably take some questions. But my six-year-old daughter said, Dad, you always tell a joke. And I said, well, this is not a place where uh, it's like I tell a lot of jokes, you know, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a comedian, I'm an auctioneer. She goes, well, you can tell a joke and I have a joke for you. So this joke is from my six-year-old daughter, Alina. And it goes like this. What did the right eye say to the left eye? Something between us smells. <laughs> Thank you very much for letting me come today. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, for the very detailed analysis presentation and also for putting a lot of smiles.